Good evening. I'm Mike Worth. I'm the Dean of the College of Communication and Information, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second keynote for CCI's Diversity and Inclusion Week. Uh, we're very privileged to have with us Chris Geidner. Chris is an award-winning uh, journalist and legal editor at BuzzFeed, where he covers national politics and the courts with a focus in, on LGBT issues and on now on the death penalty. Prior to BuzzFeed, he was the senior political editor at Metro Weekly, D.C.'s LGBT news magazine, where he covered Congress, the White House, and the courts from December 2009 until July 2012. Uh, in 2012, he won the Outstanding Magazine Article Award in the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation Media Awards for his four-part series on the 15th anniversary of the passage of the Defense of Marriage Act. He also was awarded the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association Sarah Pettit Memorial Award for Excellence in LGBT Media, as well as the Excellence in News Writing Award, the latter for his coverage of the Department of Justice's decision to stop defending the Defense of Marriage Act in court challenges. Prior to serving, uh, prior to this, he served in the Attorney General's office. Uh, uh, well, actually, I should say. And after more than two years of experience working in state government on the transition in the office of former Ohio Attorney General Mark Dan and, and then former Ohio Attorney General Nancy Rogers. I'm editing out things. That's why I'm messing up here. Prior to serving the Attorney General's office, he was an associate for more than a year at the mid-sized law firm based in Columbus, where he focused primarily on government-related litigation. He graduated in 2005 from the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law, where he served as editor-in-chief of the Ohio State Law Journal and was a research assistant for several professors. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chris, who will be speaking formal remarks for maybe about 25, 30 minutes, and then open it up to questions. So be sure you're thinking about your questions. So, Chris. Thanks a lot. Do I? I don't need that. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Um, Again, I am Chris Geidner. Uh, I was told uh, that, that I should have a, a title for this address. Um, and, and so the, the title is uh, going to be pretty simple. It's going to be a statement of fact. And it is an assertion that I am making and will hopefully uh, convince you all of in the next half hour. And that is diversity is essential. That's it. That's the title. Um, now, why and uh, everything else about this, the way that I'm going to approach this is uh, basically by, by being a good journalist and uh, giving you, answering the questions, uh, the, the, the five W's and the H of journalism uh, and, and take you through uh, why I have reached this conclusion, why a white guy from Ohio, who grew up in Ohio, uh, has decided that diversity is essential. Um, and I do have some notes. Um, so first of all, who? Uh, I am Chris Geidner. I am a journalist. Uh, I am a lawyer. I am an out gay, cis, white male. Um, th that's the basic facts. That's who I am, that's what I would define myself as if somebody asked me to define the basic facts about me. Um, obviously, that doesn't tell you much of the story, but it gives you some insights into what experiences I might have had in my life. Um, it gives you an ability to make some assumptions about what I may know, what I may not know. It gives you the chance to get an idea of what questions you might want to ask to find out more about me. Uh, but it doesn't tell you much. It tells you the surface. Um, when? Uh, I came out 20 years ago. Uh, I was, <laughs> so many of you were not born. Um, I was a freshman at college. I was at American University in Washington, DC. Um, I have been a lawyer for 10 years. I graduated from Ohio State's Moritz College of Law in 2005. Um, I've been a paid journalist for going on six years this November. Um, and, and that tells you a little more. That tells you where I've spent my time, how I've spent my time, what I've been doing to, to some extent. 
um, where. This is where we get into some details. This is how you can get to know a little bit about me. Um, I went to American University and then to Youngstown State University. That's where I got my undergraduate degree. Um, I spent three years in DC. I spent uh, then the next several years in Youngstown. Um, I, I worked on a campaign. Uh, I ran a state senate campaign. Um, right out of, of, while I was still finishing my undergraduate degree. That gave me a lot of insight into to the basics of politics. Uh, it was a state senate campaign. It was a primary election, Democratic primary in, in Youngstown, uh, which is a very Democratic area where the primary basically determines the winner. Um, so I, I got some insight into politics. After that, I went to a newspaper. I worked at the local paper, the Warren Tribune Chronicle, uh, for the next two years. Uh, and I, I learned a lot about journalism. I happened to be at a newspaper as a, a copy editor, uh, <laughs> a, a dying profession, um, and then the editorial writer at a, a, a really incredible time. Um, I was at a newspaper for the 2000 election, the, the recount um, between Al Gore and George W. Bush. Um, I was at a newspaper on September 11th. Um, I, I was at a newspaper much more dorky specific to me, but for redistricting, um, <laughs> which may not mean a lot to a lot of people, but it was something that I was really interested in and it gave me a chance to start exploring some of the specific details of that. I worked on some, some feature projects for the paper on that. Um, after then, I went to law school. Uh, I had always wanted to go to law school. I thought that it was an important part of, of what it was that I was interested in, and, and I found out I was right. Uh, I loved law school. Uh, it was the sort of environment to, to be thinking about big issues, be thinking about the way that we interact between government and people, and, and I had three years to do that. I served as the, the editor-in-chief of the Law Journal. Um, I worked for some amazing professors who were on the cutting edge of a lot of research um, on sexual orientation issues, on criminal justice issues, uh, and judging by the, the description that, that the dean just gave of me, um, that, that still continue to this day with what I do. Um, after law school, I went to a law firm. I worked at a law firm for two years. I worked uh, for the state government for two years and uh, got a lot of experience understanding how government works, how uh, legal institutions work. You can, here, we can, we can handle this quickly. <laughs> And during that time, the, the attorney general that I worked for resigned from office. Uh, an interim AG was appointed. Uh, so I got to see that. I got to see a, a state office in disarray. <laughs> um, wasn't a highlight of my career, but it certainly gave me a lot of insights into the way that these processes work. Um, I then moved back to DC. I had always wanted to move back to DC, but the opportunities that I had had in, in Columbus were, were really cool and I had wanted to pursue them. So when I moved back to DC, I worked at Metro Weekly, uh, but I came to Metro Weekly with a lot of experience that a lot of young journalists didn't have. I had worked in a state office, I had worked on a campaign, I had worked as a lawyer. And so when I came to DC and was covering things like the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, was covering the beginnings of the end of the Defense of Marriage Act, I had spent more than a year in each of the sort of processes that are involved in that. I had spent time in government. I had spent time as a lawyer. I had spent time in a campaign. And, and so I, uh, I often say that I, I come to those stories with a, an ability to both understand and, and think of what the positive motivations that a lawmaker or an elected official might have, while also being able to be completely skeptical uh, and not be deferential. Um, a lot of, I, I feel like a lot of journalists either veer too far into like, I have a goal that I'm going to prove in advance because I think one person is right and, and end up that, that's the people who are critiqued as sort of being cheerleaders. 
But then there's the, the other side, and that's the, the side that you often see critiqued. But I, I think there's another side of, of people who just think journalists who go into it because they think everybody's wrong and everything is awful and, and everybody's trying to do harm. And, and my job as a journalist is to prove why they're wrong. I think that those people also find a lot of false stories because they end up just looking for problems. And lots of the times, the, the problems are accidental, the problems are incidental, the problems come up because of a failure of oversight. And, and if, you're, if you don't understand that there can be good motivations and bad outcomes, you're, you're gonna miss that, and you're going to be looking for problems. Um, after spending two and a half years at Metro Weekly, I did go to BuzzFeed, uh, and I was at BuzzFeed at a time I was the 49th editorial employee. Uh, I was the 127th employee overall. Uh, we are now over a thousand employees and if you count our video team and all of our uh, BuzzFeed content side, uh, we have more than 500 editorial side employees. Um, so it's been a, an incredible uh, three, three plus years that I, I've uh, seen that growth. Um, what do I do? Uh, I'm a lawyer, <laughs> a politico, and a journalist comms person. Uh, and I've played three different roles. Uh, I, I was a lawyer who understood policy and communications. Uh, and that made me a, a really valuable lawyer. Uh, I was able to do a lot of things that a lot of lawyers just aren't good at communicating, aren't good at understanding that there are political implications to what they're doing. Uh, and, and so was able to, when I was in the AG's office, I was often the, the person who would speak to the press when a, a story was, was just too legally complex for the comm staff to, to handle it. Um, when I was, when I became more of a policy lawyer, I was a policy lawyer who understood communications. Uh, now I'm a journalist who gets law and policy. Uh, and, and that uh, is really unusual. Um, there are a lot of lawyers who get politics really, really, really well. Uh, a lot of journalists who, who live and breathe politics, uh, but just, just don't know the law. Um, and when they veer into those legal stories, you just get bad journalism. Uh, but then there are a lot of good legal reporters who just either don't care about politics or don't care about policy uh, or just aren't good at communicating about the law to a broad audience. And what I think I found is that I am in that, that sort of sweet spot that I'm able to explain legal issues to a broad audience uh, and understand that there are oftentimes policy and political implications to those legal decisions. And sometimes those are more important than the legal implications. Uh, and so, so being able to report on both sides of that. Um, and now I get to do that at BuzzFeed, and that's really, really cool. Um, it, it's really cool for a lot of the, the superficial reasons uh, that you might think. Like, it's cool to be at BuzzFeed. <laughs> uh, it's really awesome. <laughs> there are a lot of really cool things that happen there. There are a lot of really amazing people who work there. There are a lot of really famous people who come through the office whenever I'm up in the New York office, not so much the DC office. Um, but, uh, it's also been amazing to be at an operation like BuzzFeed at this time. Um, so why is diversity essential? Uh, I, I have five main reasons. Um, the, the first reason is the, the, the obvious reason that I, I would imagine most people in this room probably agree with, and that's why you're here, is that it, it, it's the moral right thing to do. Um, it, it, it's not good to exclude people. <laughs> like, there. <laughs> That's simple. Uh, it, 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 it is, it, it is a, 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 a good to increase the number of people who are telling stories, the types of people who are telling stories, the, the, what your newsroom looks like. It, 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 it is the right thing to do. Um, but that's also not an answer that you can go much further than that. Uh, that, that's sort of just a, a statement. 
and somebody can disagree with it and, and make a case, try to make a case, that, that is different, it, but it's not an argument that can go much places. It's, it's an argument that just breaks down into screaming matches about political correctness and, and doesn't really advance a conversation. But I, I actually think that's, that's kind of the least important reason uh, for, for journalists to care about diversity. Um, it's also smart business. Um, it, it, it is, the, the way of engaging with audiences that haven't been engaged with before. Uh, it's a way of including people in your newsroom who are going to come up with ideas that are not being generated at other publications. Um, the fact is, if you have people who, when I read that, the who, when you have people who have different answers for those who questions, they're going to come up with different answers. And, and, and that makes it smart business. When we have people in a room like this, who, who we have a pretty diverse room here. If we each were asked to list like the five most important stories, we'd probably come up with some really different answers. And we'd have different ways, even if we came up with lists that looked similar, we'd come up with very different ways of reporting out those stories. And, and that's why it's smart business, because if you have different people in the room, you're going to come up with more stories that look different, that pursue different angles, that, that tell the story in a way that it just hasn't been told before. And, and it's amazing when you do that, even just, just the smallest bit, how much it is noticed and how much it changes what your newsroom is like. Um, when, when, when I was hired, uh, we were one of the first, when, when we opened the DC Bureau, we opened it with the DC Bureau Chief, John Stanton, who had been uh, a DC reporter for, for decades, uh, and, and me, who was at the, the LGBT magazine. Um, and it was in a, I was hired as full-time LGBT federal reporter. Uh, and that was noted. Um, the, the American Journalism Review like did a story on like how BuzzFeed was starting off its DC Bureau very alternatively, very different. Um, and, and Ben basically said like, other publications aren't taking this story seriously. It, this is a big story. This is an important story that everybody cares about nationally, and other publications are sloughing it off as like one-off stories from other reporters, but we're going to have a reporter who is full-time focused on telling this story. And six months later, the Supreme Court decided that they were going to hear the Defense of Marriage Act case, Windsor, and the California Prop 8 case, Perry, and then everybody else started paying attention and we had a six month head start. And, and it's that sort of awareness of telling diverse stories that, that gets you ahead of the curve because you've already got people in the room who are thinking about the stories before they become national stories. Um, it, 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 is, it is smart journalism. It, it gets you ahead of the story. Um, it, it, it gets you into the story earlier. It gets you telling the story before, before anybody else is paying attention. And, and it, it's bad journalism not to do it because you are going to miss stories. You aren't going to be able to figure out the angles of stories if you don't do it. You, you cannot ask all of the questions. Even if you think you're asking all of the questions, you're not, because I am always going to have, well, an ever-growing number of years of experience as a, my birthday was on Monday, so it is now a, a, a greater year. Um, I, I, I am always going to come to stories with the experience of 38 years of living as a gay, cis, white man. Like, that is going to be my experience. I'm not going to have the experience of going through life as a black man. I'm not going to go through the life as, as anybody other than who I am. 
And, and that makes my ideas for stories different. Now, that, that's why I come up with good story ideas that I come up with, but it doesn't, it doesn't give me a monopoly on good story ideas. And it doesn't mean I'm going to be able to figure out all of the story ideas. I do better as a journalist when I have people who have different experiences able to talk about those stories with me. Able, my, I, I mean, I, I came from, I worked in a democratic administration, I worked for democratic pol politicians, so I, I come from that background. I work with an editor who came from the Free Beacon, which is, is a, a conservative publication in DC, and we toss ideas off each other constantly because we have very different vantage points. Um, when we're running the, the LGBT vertical, uh, we, we have different staffers who come from different backgrounds. Saeed Jones is, is a black man. Uh, Shannon Keating is a lesbian woman. Meredith is a trans woman. Uh, we, we all bring different stories uh, to, to the table, and we all bring different perspectives to the table. And, and that means that we're able to come up with exponentially more ideas than publications that have a lot of gay publications are gay publications, even if they say they're LGBT publications. And they have like three gay white guys writing for them. And they come up with a lot of stories that are, are very narrow. Um, whereas BuzzFeed has had some really extensive coverage of trans issues that, that I think was a, a lot further ahead of the curve than a lot of publications. Um, it's also pragmatic. Like, you, you're seeing what's out there, and it, if you are avoiding diversity at this point in like your basic understanding of how to operate pretty much any business, like, you, you're missing America. Like, <laughs> if you're going to do it in America, <laughs> um, you're, you're, sort of, you're, you're sort of not on board with, with what's going on out there. And, and just demographically alone, you, you are missing the story. And, and so just as a pragmatic function of who your applicants are going to be, who your readership is going to be, like it, it just pragmatically makes sense to care about diversity. Otherwise, your publication is just going to, I mean, going to become a, a minority publication, even if it is just directed at, at straight white men. Um, and finally, it, it's unavoidable. Um, and this is, this is my social pitch. Um, th this is my social media pitch. Like, you can't not, um, because the story will happen. Um, the story is going to happen on social media, and the question is whether you are covering it or whether you are covering it poorly or whether you are not covering it at all. Those are your three choices. Um, but the story's going to happen. Uh, I, I think, I mean, we've obviously seen this over the past year with Black Lives Matter. Um, I, I, I think that, that is the, the clearest example of the fact that, like, this is unavoidable. And, and you, are, you are just, I mean, it's basically malpractice at this point if you're not paying attention. Uh, because the stories are going to happen and people don't need your publication to tell them about this story, whatever, whatever the story is. Like, they're going to find it. In, I mean, I've watched, I mean, from the, the perspective of, of the, the trans killings across the country, um, I've watched as city after city <laughs> deals with trans killings by first ignoring the killing, then killing the, covering the killing horribly, then eventually figuring out like, oh, we need to actually learn how to do this. Uh, or, or we're going con to continue to have like our social, our poor social media editor who comes crying to us at the end of every day about what's going on on Twitter to their paper. Um, 
that, that they need to get with it because they start out with, with this complete, like, it, it's hard to judge motive. You don't want to judge motive. Um, but either a lack of concern, a lack of compassion, a lack of understanding, whatever it is that, that motivates initial coverage in a lot of cities. And it, it's hard not to generalize because, like, our Dominic Holden, our, one of our LGBT reporters, um, ha has covered pretty much every trans killing this year, uh, a, along with David Mack, depending on who's on. And, and like, we've seen this happen a dozen times over this year alone. And it, it, it's, it is the same each time. It, it's bad, I mean, not in every city, I mean, there are exceptions, but there is just either non-coverage or like a, a, like a sentence on a police blotter um, that almost always misgenders the person. Um, and, and then when like there's an outcry and people in the community realize that this was a trans person killed and it appears to have been in some way motivated by the person's gender identity, then like there will be an outcry and then the paper will do a story like some editor is like, why aren't we on this? And somebody rushes together a story that's really horribly done and then national publications, national media watchdogs, people who follow this, trans activists, LGBT media people will, will take this on and, and really uh, attack the, the story and, and be like, you are doing this poorly. And, and then they sort of like, will sit down with people, will actually learn how to cover the story and, and will then start better coverage. Um, and, and almost all the time now at this point, they do start getting better coverage at that point. Um, but, but that's not how you want to go about a business literally needing to wait until you're attacked to figure out how to do a story well, um, because the story is going to be happening no matter what. So how do you do this? Um, I, I think it, it, it comes down to three main components. Um, awareness, leadership, and intentionality. Um, and and I, I talked about this earlier uh, with, with the Beacon staff. Um, but it, it takes basic awareness of the issues before you can start reporting on them. And that, that's really what I was just talking about in terms of the trans killings. Um, you, you need to understand an issue before you're going to cover it if you want to cover it well. You can't have your first report about a story be like basically a rough draft of like, here's what I learned, like a, a summer book report, here's what I learned this summer. Um, it, you have to be, your reporting as a reporter has to be step two. It has to be me telling a story that I know about. Uh, it can't be, here's what I've learned. Um, and, and so it, it takes awareness in order to tell diverse stories well. Uh, it, it, it takes awareness in order to be able to be inclusive about your coverage. And that's awareness of what you don't know. Like, that, that's the hardest thing as a journalist, because as a journalist, you, you want to be smart. You want to be the smartest person. You want to be aware of what you're talking about. But like part of being a good journalist is knowing what you don't know, um, because that's when you can go to other people. That's when you can ask questions. That's when you can go outside your bubble, and I can go outside my experience and go to other people and get answers. Um, leadership. It takes leadership. Like, if the people at the top of an organization don't care about diversity, it's not going to go anywhere because the people who are pushing it are going to not feel supported. They're going to feel like they don't have the resources they need. They're going to feel like they don't get the opportunities that they need in order to do good work. And so it, it takes leadership that is devoted to diversity as an essential value of the organization in order to succeed. And, and finally, it takes intentionality. Diversity is not easy. Diversity is not easy. It takes a very intentional, organizational, 
dedication to becoming a diverse newsroom, becoming a diverse workplace, and becoming a diverse storytelling operation. Uh, that's what you are as journalists. No matter what publication you're at, you are a storytelling operation. And if you want to cover the entire scope of stories, you need to have a diverse storytelling operation. And, and that takes very intentional efforts, both in, in hiring, in promotion, in retention, in types of stories, in targeted communities, in devotion of resources, in, in the types of special projects you do. They, they all need to be intentional. You, you will not accidentally fall into a great diverse newsroom. You have to be thinking about it. And that in, includes people, I mean, one of the, the when, when we finished the marriage story, not finished, but when, when the Supreme Court decision came down this June and Ben, the editor-in-chief, wrote extraordinarily wonderful things about me that were way too kind, um, the one thing that he said that, that I really appreciated was, was not at all about the marriage story, but was about my role in the organization at pushing for diversity within the organization from the time I got there. Um, and, and I mean, and it was true. Um, it, has, it was something when I got there that, that they had worked very hard on making sure that the, the tech startup, which is traditionally very white male, was included women <laughs> and, and was a diverse newsroom that included gender parity. Um, then they, they, I got there and I was like, it's very white, very, very, very white. Are we going to fix that? Yeah, yeah, we'll fix that. No, like now, what are we going to do to fix that? A and that meant making sure that we were going outside of the people who had experiences like us. We were asking people to circulate our job postings that weren't just us. <laughs> if, if 40 white people circulate job postings on their social media networks, guess who's going to apply? A lot of white people and some of their friends. Every once in a while, they're going to have diverse friends. Um, but if all of a sudden you get some of the top black journalists in the country sending out BuzzFeed's job postings, that's a whole new group of journalists who are going to be applying because they're going to see this person thinks that, that these jobs are worth applying for. And then you're going to start getting more diverse people in the newsroom. And then you need to remember to be promoting them. And then you need to remember to actually be giving them authority. And then you need to be making sure to include them in important discussions about where the newsroom's going. And, and it's been so amazing to watch that. Um, one of the prime examples outside of journalism where, where we've seen sort of this change happening uh, is in Hollywood. Um, the, the essential nature of diversity um, has been seen over the, the past few years um, as, as more diverse shows have come on board. As, I mean, Shonda Rhimes has changed TV forever. Um, she, she has, the, the world which she has created <laughs> and which she has been allowed to, to foster um, with, 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 starting with, with, uh, Grey's Anatomy and, and going into to scandal and then going into to how to get away with murder it is not something you would have seen on TV for, ever. Um, and, and the fact that she has that ha, ha, has made shows like Empire possible. And now when you see shows that come along that, that are, are incredibly undiverse and incredibly unaware uh, of, of where the world is today, you see the reaction being different. You see the, 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 their ability to succeed in social media be very, very horrible. Um, the, the example that, that I've dealt with recently was, was the Stonewall movie. Um, that 
everybody was excited about it in theory. And then the trailer came out and it was, was very non-diverse and had a cis white male lead uh, who looked like he was out of central casting for like a 1985 straight movie. And the period between then and when the movie came out, the, the director did everything wrong he could do to make it worse by literally saying that he picked a, a straight acting lead because he wanted it to, to make sense to middle America. Um, and it was like, where have you been for the past 20 years? Like, ha have you not seen that there are gay people everywhere and they don't all look like you? Um, no, he hadn't. Um, and you know what? On Monday morning, on my birthday, <laughs> um, the, when the, the weekend's box office came out, it, it was 29th at the box office for the weekend and had made $112,000 of its $12 million budget. Oops. Diversity is essential. Um, diversity is essential on university. Um, you all have been dealing with this gender neutral pronouns issue. Um, I think it's a really good example of looking at awareness, leadership, and intentionality. Um, and I think on all three points, this has sort of been an example of what not to do and where things fall down. Um, there clearly was not awareness about these issues and how gender neutral pronouns are used, what the purpose of even talking about gender neutral pronouns is, why you would be talking about the use of gender neutral pronouns, and that lack of awareness then led to a vacuum in which a lot of misperceptions, a lot of just flat out falsehoods were shared, a lot of, of scare tactics were employed, a lot of totally inane threats were made. Um, and, and then there was a failure of leadership and there was no understanding from the, the senior people within the university management of why this is important, why the Office of Diversity and Inclusion should be doing, should be the, the ideal people doing this sort of work. And, and then there was no intentionality. There, there, there was no effort to use this as an opportunity to talk more about these issues. This is an opportunity to invite the, the head of the, the trustees or whatever to, to come to the campus and talk with the head of the diversity of inclusion, talk with LGBT clubs on campus about what's going on and why these are issues that students want to be discussing. Um, all three of those things need to happen in order for diversity to succeed. And, and it, when you don't have them, you see what happens. Um, and, and, and I think that, that this happens everywhere. This doesn't just happen here. Um, whenever there is a failure on any of those three points, you see little breakdowns that turn into big breakdowns because there isn't, when, when people don't feel supported, they don't feel comfortable contributing. And when people don't feel comfortable contributing, then they're not willing to be a part of a diverse community. And that, that happens to publications a lot. If a publication becomes known as a sexist publication, they have trouble attracting women because why would you want to work there if it's known as a sexist publication? The New Republic had a, a reputation as an old white boys club because it was mainly old white men. Um, and they went through a really tumultuous period where they got rid of a lot of the senior staff and brought in a lot of new young people. And that led to a huge outcry. There was, I mean, it was like think piece hot take central in like everybody who had ever been affiliated with the New Republic, who was basically white men, and writing these things about how like freedom was being destroyed and the death of an institution. And they brought in some really great people and they're doing some really great work, and they're doing different work, and they're doing more diverse work. And Gabriel Sherman and Jamil Smith are, are 
come from more diverse operations and have, I mean, Jamil Smith was work, had worked on Rachel Maddow's show and then went to Melissa Harris Perry's show and, and now is at the New Republic. If you told somebody that, that a, a, guy, a black guy would have gone from a lesbian show to a black professor's show on a liberal channel to the New Republic, even five years ago, people would have been like, well, he'll make it six months. That's what they would have said. And, and now there is an opportunity for change in the institution. And there is an opportunity to change that, that impact that the publication can have because the perception was changed. And it took a forceful change of the perception of the institution that led to some people saying that it was the destruction of the institution. But that's what they did because they wanted to make those changes. And I mean, I had criticized a lot of Chris Hughes' early tenure since he bought the publication. Um, and I, I think he took the time he needed to figure out what he needed and then he did it. Um, and he was He's a multimillionaire and he was willing to weather any storm because he was like, this is my vanity project, so this is what I think it needs. Um, and and that, that was awareness, leadership, and intentionality at play in, in the best way in the face of a lot of criticism and, and just going forward and steaming full speed ahead. And, and they've gotten to a place less than, I don't even know how long it's been, but like I don't even remember think of TNR the same way at this point. Like, I recommended it earlier <laughs> at the Beacon as like a positive example. And like, as I said it, I was like, oh, well, I guess they've succeeded. <laughs> like, that's the only reason I thought to bring it up now, because when I said it earlier, I was like, you would not have recommended TNR a year ago. <laughs> um, and, and, and so I, I, I think that, that that's why diversity is essential, um, because it does enable you to tell better stories in a world that wants to hear everybody's stories. And in a world in which if you don't tell them, they're going to get their stories from elsewhere. And, and so you just have to be there or, or you're just not going to be able to succeed. Um, and, and I feel like I've been at, at a really, I, I'm eternally grateful for the fact that I've been found myself at a place that, that supports that, believes in it, is willing to put their money and their, their publication behind it. Um, so I am now open to whatever questions you may have about my work, about journalism, about diversity, about BuzzFeed. Go at it. You talked about getting um, diverse people in certain positions um, or particular jobs um, by giving them simply the opportunity. So once they get the opportunity and they apply, how likely were they or are they to actually get the job? Um, I, I think good candidates get, get the jobs. Um, and I, I think that part of understanding who good candidates are it is understanding that you can have somebody, that you can bring somebody to your operation who is going to like add something to the operation that you don't have. Um, that's actually a part of it. That is not, that is not a, a quota, that is not a set aside, that is not a token. And it does need, to, and that's actually really important, it does need to be more than token. Like, you are not going to succeed without a critical mass of people in your newsroom who understand different stories. Um, and, and, I mean, so, I mean, part of finding good candidates is what does this person add to our newsroom? Like, a, a job in any location, in any job, any career, does, it does not work alone. Like unless, <laughs> unless you're some millionaire hiring one person to run an operation, no, no job is, is just a standalone. You, you are hiring somebody to fit in an existing ecosystem. And, and the question is, what does this person bring to the ecosystem? 
Now, a lot of the times, that very question, people are aware of that issue. And a lot of the times, that has worked against diverse candidates, because people like their ecosystem to be a bunch of older white guys. Um, and, and they don't want <laughs> that ecosystem being upset. But if you, if you, and this is why that the leadership matters, and it's not just opportunity, if you understand that your aim is to make that ecosystem be more diverse and include different voices and include discordant voices who are not always going to agree with you. Um, I mean, I have disagreed with, with Ben, our editor-in-chief, and Shawnee, our, our deputy, and Catherine, our politics editor, countless times over time. I haven't always won. Um, I often lose um, <laughs> because they are above me. Um, but but they, they bring me in. They have me because they know that I, I'm not going to back down just because they have a different opinion. Um, I mean, honestly, the, the, I mean, when, when he was introducing, when the dean was introducing me, he talked about the death penalty. Um, that was a, a six-month operation of convincing all of my editors that it was worth it for us to, to go on board. Um, I, I started out by saying, like, oh, I think this is, is what I want to sort of focus on after marriage. And they were like, oh, okay, start, start covering it then. Um, you, you're a reporter. Um, and, and so what, what we did was we started covering executions that were actually happening in the U.S., um, and, and I got somebody on the breaking news desk who was interested in executions as well to, to join with me and do that. Um, but it was just in existing, in the existing structure, nothing bonus. Um, and it turned out us doing that alone was more than a lot of operations were doing um, and got us a lot of attention from people who care about the death penalty on both sides. And they started feeding us more and more information. Um, and, and then I, I pitched for like basically when, once the Supreme Court accepted the marriage case and we knew marriage was likely going to be settled by June, I said like I basically want the death penalty. As I say now, death is my new marriage. Um, I wanted the death penalty re to replace marriage as my like primary focus. They were like, huh, that's, that's interesting. And, and their idea, they pushed back and they were like, Pretty much every publication over the past 30 years has like decided to focus on the death penalty at some point. And they basically rewrite the same three stories and or they track like one innocence claim for a year and a half, and that's all they do. And they don't really break through, they don't really tell any new stories. Are you gonna do something new and bring us that? And so I then spent the next three months sort of looking around, digging around, looking at what other coverage was. And then I was like, OK, here's what we're going to do. Here's my plan. And let's bring on another person. <laughs> so you still haven't approved the, the story idea, but I'd like you to hire somebody. Um, and they were like, that's really aggressive and adorable. Um, <laughs> And so I had him apply for a job um, on the investigations team. And they brought him in for an interview. We, we didn't, hired somebody else, but people liked him. And we then went forward. And as we got towards the, the end of, of marriage, I was like, so the Supreme Court is ruling. What are we going to do? And uh, I was actually, I was going, it was, I guess it was either right before or right after, right before the oral arguments in the marriage case. I uh, met with them and like laid out the plan and they were like, we'll think about it. And I went home from New York and was like really upset and was like, eh, well, that was a waste of a trip to New York. <laughs> um, they were not sold. And four days later, I get a call from Shawnee and she's like, so I think we're gonna hire Chris. I think we're gonna give Chris an offer. He's Chris, too. Um, we're the death Chrises. Um, and, uh, and I was like, really? What happened? And she was like, well, we listened, and we, we you've got it. And uh, I was like, I, I mean, I told Chris, I was like, I don't know if we wore them down or I convinced them. But either way, we, we, get, we get our operation. Um, and Chris came on, and they are fully on board, 
and have devoted a lot of resources to it. We have people on several teams who are helping us with, with stories. And it, it's now a focus that, I mean, last night I was up till 1 a.m. tracking uh, the execution in Georgia of Kelly Gissendainer. Um, and our people are tracking the executions now uh, in Oklahoma and Virginia that are proceeding. Well, we're scheduled over the next two days, but it looks like both of them are off. And uh, last night, somebody was, a bunch of people were talking about how BuzzFeed has like some of the best death penalty con coverage in the country. Um, and, and so like if you have an operation that is willing to get involved in a conversation and has the, the, the resources to do it, like then those things become bonuses. And having diverse voices in the ecosystem becomes a bonus. And then when you're looking at positions, you're looking for who, who adds to this ecosystem. And, and like it's ac an actual thing that you're, you're wanting because it will make your newsroom better. It's like, oh, well, we've got like three white guys doing this. Like we, we need something looking different in this ecosystem, or it's not going to be the same. Um, Tazneem Najrula is the, the person on the breaking news desk who uh, is helping out on death penalty stories. And it, it turns out there is a guy from India who is selling death penalty drugs. Tazneem is from, her family is from India, and she was visiting home and was able to track down where this guy's office was. Um, and, and that's something, like, as soon as we, like, had in a story that it was maybe India, like, Tasneem, like, went on this tear and, like, went off and did research for the next three days, getting us more information about this guy and where he was located and what the office park was like where he was. And, and like, if I had tried to do that, I would have spent three weeks and I wouldn't have found the, the same stuff. Um, and so it's just like, you get those even accidental bonuses to wanting that ecosystem that remind you how important the, the ecosystem itself is and not just like thinking about it in terms of one job. Um, just, I wanted to clarify the role that you played in the, um, the marriage equality cases. Was it just mainly reporting it through BuzzFeed or were you also um, with your legal background, were you like at all legally involved, or was it? Strictly oh no, just I, I was a reporter um, from. I mean, I guess in history, yes, I was involved. Uh, before I was a reporter, I uh, had uh, worked on a case as a lawyer defending the University of Miami of Ohio uh, when it was offering domestic partner benefits to its employees, even after the passage of Ohio's a marriage amendment. Um, I had worked on campaign committees for and against LGBT issues um, when, when I was in law school. Um, but in terms of, as a, as a journalist, no, I mean, I, I am, I mean, in something like that we were talking about earlier at the Beacon, um, I mean, my, my position on sort of like when people talk about bias, um, and, and I, I think that diverse reporters get this a lot more than other people. Um, I mean, nobody asks a, a, a white male, a straight white male reporter, why he reports on things for the Wall Street Journal that oppose affirmative action. Um, nobody asks, et cetera continue ad nauseum. Um, and yet one black reporter writes one story about affirmative action and they get asked about bias. I write one story about marriage, I get asked about bias. I mean, my whole take on bias is, is ha has crystallized and gotten really simple. If, if you believe that you're right, you don't need to put bias in the story, just tell the facts. Like, if you think you're right, like, Report the story out and let the reader decide. Like you, 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 if you're right, you're right. Like y your job as a journalist is to tell other people the story. Uh, and, and that involves that awareness, like making people aware of stories 
a lot of the times is the beginning of discussions. And that, I mean, that's one of the most important roles that journalists can play is when you tell a story that isn't being told, that, that will oftentimes start a discussion in a community. Okay, this is kind of a weird way to start a question, but I follow you on Twitter and you tweet a lot of things whenever there's um, any type of news on the television. And um, I was wondering if you feel like it's necessary to do that because of your job at BuzzFeed or you just really like sharing your opinion on your personal Twitter? Um, I mean, I think that I'm crazy and so that's part of it. Um, well, it's I mean, just like a, it's a lot of like, it's a lot of tweets and that's awesome. Lot. I just didn't know if you feel like you need to do that because of your job. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm, I mean, it's just on my time feed, I promise. I don't know yeah, how to get no, um, I mean, like, it, it's, I mean, I think that, I mean, I would actually sort of reverse it and probably, I mean, Ben would reverse it and say, like, he's always on Twitter and that's part of why he got his job. Um, <laughs> like, I, I, I think they're related, but probably not, I mean, there's certainly not any, like, feeling like, oh, I work at BuzzFeed, so I need to be on Twitter. Um, it's the reality that, I mean, last night I was, how many, uh, 16 minutes ahead of the AP on the first Supreme Court stay denial for Kelly Gissendaner, Gissendaner, and that continued throughout the night. Like, the AP was almost like a filing or decision behind me um, to the extent that, like, because my tweets were being retweeted so much, like people were getting confused about what the AP tweets meant. And um, I had to like explain it to people. I was like, no, the AP is just really behind. Um, sorry, AP. Um, and I mean, so that's part of it is like being a good journalist is like being first and being right. And like the best way to be first and be right on in this era is tweeting about it. Um, in terms of like, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think I tweet a lot of opinions. Um, I, th I think, <laughs> I would say it's analysis. Um, <laughs> analysis is journalists uh, catch all saving. Uh, statement analysis is um, conclusions based on your understanding of the facts um, <laughs> as opposed to opinion which is just um, what you think the outcome should be and that I would I would draw that distinction I mean that's the distinction is oftentimes I mean I'm sure there are times when I veer into opinion but like I think oftentimes when I'm when I'm tweeting about things uh, a lot, it's sort of like, where is this person getting this? Why is this person doing this? Um, a lot of questions and a lot of like, well, this doesn't quite gel with this. This doesn't quite gel with that. Um, and, and I mean, a lot of it is because that's where the conversation's happening. That, I, I mean, I often say whenever I live tweet something, I, uh, have a net of like plus 40 followers from small event, a net of plus 200 for a big event. Um, and like that's deceptive because I probably lost 10 followers, but I gained 50, whatever it is. Um, and I don't really care. Like, like people choose what they want. Um, I mean, whenever I tweet the, the, the award shows, like, I pick up a bunch of followers who the next morning when I'm at the Supreme Court tweeting, like, cert petition denials, they're like, what did I do last night? Like, they were hungover. They were like, did I black out and follow, like, some crazy guy? Like, this boring person who's tweeting nothing? I'm like, nope, that, that, was, that was in the evening, and this is my morning. Um, like, I think I did go, like, from the, the Tony Awards to Supreme Court decisions uh, in June. Like, pretty much that's a a June happening where I'm tweeting about musicals all night and then then uh, 
Although that's every trip to New York for me. So, um, I, I mean, but I also think that's part of it is like my Twitter feed is also very authentically me. Um, and like I'll allow the BuzzFeed News a tweet account to like pick up like people who just want breaking news stories and want sort of a curated account of like 10 of my tweets in any given day. Um, but like, like my Twitter account has been me since I started it when I restarted my blog after I left the AG's office. Um, and it, it's done pretty well for me. <laughs> Anything else? A last question? Uh, given your political expertise and everything, I was just wondering, most of like the major the major talking points right now in politics are diver diversity issues with immigration, with marriage equality, with Planned Parenthood. The GOP is kind of, they're, they're on one side of all those issues. Are we living in the last days of the GOP? Can they win <laughs> elections with those views? We'll see. Um, <laughs> The best journalist answer. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's interesting to watch. I think, I mean, I, I had a, a pretty aggressive view, and I, I think we have seen it, for the most part, uh, carry out that once the marriage decision came down, that it was sort of one of the greatest blessings to the GOP, because they wouldn't have to talk about it as much. Um, I, I, I actually think, I mean, and I do think we saw that. I mean, the fact that only Ted Cruz and Mike Huckabee uh, were like on the ground to defend Kim Davis, I think, is is notable. Um, even though they did get a lot of attention for their appearances, like I, I think if we had been in 2008, you would have seen everybody there. Uh, and, and at this point, it's sort of uh, wrote statements about like balancing religious liberty with. The, the court's decision, and I, I think that, that the court, I still think the court decision for the GOP was like one of the best things that could have happened for them, um, because I, I think all of the Democrats would have loved to have been able to campaign on that issue um, this time around, um, and I, I think very few of the Republicans would have wanted to. I mean, they're able to, they're actually able to nuance their answer more in a primary now because the decision is done. And so they're able to be like, well, I don't agree with the decision and that's not my personal view, but the court has ruled and I care about religious liberty now. And that's really the position of almost all of them. Um, and they're, they're able to sort of be like, well, my personal decision, but the court's ruled, sorry. Um, and, and they can then like, they'll do a mailer to like, or do like a radio thing to like 10 people, a hundred people, whatever, about like, oh, that's Supreme Court. We care about the Supreme Court because of decisions like the marriage ruling. Um, and that line will be in those, but like, it, it isn't really an issue. Um, I think on immigration, it, it is hurt, hurting them in some states. I think, I mean, the fact, like, I mean, this is when we get into, like, discussion about, like, winner-take-all states and stuff like that. I mean, I think the fact that, like, you have, like, a winner-take-all in California makes it much less of an issue than it would be otherwise. Um, because he, he, if Republican politicians felt like they were fighting at all for California's votes, they probably would care a lot more. Um, and, but again, this is that, that demographic issue. Like, as demographics change, like, I, I think there, there was something after, after Boehner announced he was resigning that was like the smartest thing Republicans could do is encourage Boehner to put through the immigration reform package that passed the Senate previously and end this before he leaves. And he can take the, the bullet for the Republican Party because he's done. Um, and and I, I can see why that argument makes sense uh, for, for the reason that you're, you're sort of the, the underlying premise of your question. Um, but I think that that's an issue that the, the party is dealing with. Um, and we're, we're seeing it on stage every, every few weeks for the next several months. <laughs> anything, anything else or are we wrapping up?
I want to just thank you on behalf of the College of Communication and Information. Thank you. Six years ago when we began our diversity inclusion program, we had the great opportunity to have two keynoters. And today Chris has enlightened us on issues that are relevant to each and every one. And so uh, our superstar here sitting, again, have another round of applause. <laughs> thank you so much. Our theme this year has been unifying and transforming our world. You get it, the UT? And we've done it through self, we've done it through the home, we've done it through your school community here at UT. Today we did it through community. Our last, uh, through uh, transforming, from looking at the post-Ferguson world and coming to America and immigration issues. Tomorrow we will conclude with our workplace by looking at social media etiquette in the world and diversity and inclusion in the workplace, so the workplace. And our culminating activity will be our festival. Now, we will have this festival come rain, <laughs> snow, not really, or shine. And so how many of you knew about this week? I just want to get a poll, a post reading. How many of you knew about diversity and inclusion week, first of all, is happening in our college? Let me see, the sign of hands. OK. Grant. Wow. Well, that's well they're here. They're here. So. How many of you knew about the festival? OK. Now you know. Look at all the signs. Be open. But it is a way of building community. And that's what we are trying to do. Uh, we'll have our deans and directors and some of our uh, professors out there grilling hamburgers, veggie burgers, all t three different types of salads, baked beans. Oh, it'll be grand. We, if, the, if it's sunshiny, we'll have in Inflatables, yeah. And if not, we'll still have a grand time with games and all types of performances. We do this because we want to bring our community together, and we think we have the best um, college um, at the University of Tennessee. So, and uh, <laughs> last but not least, there is competition among the different schools. Last year, the advertising and PR won. That's embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Year before that, <laughs> the year before that, communication studies. So uh, we really want to know who will get the award and bragging rights, even with all the uh, our our clubs and programs we have. But again, we want to thank you for being here, listening. We want you to become aware of what's happening, and you are our ambassadors today and tomorrow. So when I pick up my little cane and start walking, I want to know it's in safe hands. So uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And thank our distinguished guest, Chris. And um, he will be here for you to, oh, well, I guess he's not. He's going to another uh, a session. <laughs> but, I'll be here for uh, a few He'll be a few minutes. minutes. So again, thank you. And let's give him another round of applause.